This is Michael Daly. I'm going to read Romance with the Unexpected, which is a very long poem, uh, approximately 45 minutes. And uh, it's the final poem in m my book, Reinhabited New and Selected Poems, published by Dos Madres Press of Loveland, Ohio, in 2022. Romance with the Unexpected. This is how good you are. In this room where you often appear, windows filled with swirls of river meander from glacial drip to the bay's wild crush, while you lean on a windowsill and wonder beyond the rooftops. In this room where sometimes you dance, I envy your romance with the unexpected Boughs weighted by buds jeweled in spring rain, sheen of goldfinch darkened on the tip of thin yew branch. And in this room, I sort through notes you drop from sometimes troubled hearts, drafts I don't promise not to steal, hold up to the light, and search for gold-tipped songbirds. That was the sincerest year. The young, undeceived by truth, left the room for a lie. Who, that age, owned the mind? I learned I must train to be patient with my hollowed-out instrument, tried to practice a slow, honest breath. The poem was a spool of silk, and as John Dewey said of a child touching flame, the burn is the original seeing. The muse was my classroom teacher, a little appalled I was so cryptic I wouldn't raise my hand to answer. Was that prideful? To the curl she unspooled off the tip of the poem, or her shout to the class, who has ears to hear giants? So I stepped up, but then I awoke, and the brain as always kept talking. The feet slipped into their slippers, the hand groped for its pencil, and the eye from the sleep of fire hunted her ferocious glare. Coming into the Northwest, without wind or sun, I arrive on psilocybin in a fog soup up the fjord, where herons stalk what we can never know. A white stallion missing, 1972, a hazy October morning in a Pacific cove. I have already saved Sue from the pervert and indented Lincoln, who might, he said, drop her at Carson City. The hate wells up still. The next ride was the last, north, a Chevy Nova. I remember only the slow tires paddle up 101. No one knew what this was. Puget's sound said Danny at the wheel, passing his jug of electric wine. Impossible trees along the bank vanish at their crown into what could be cloud or thickets of air where vines and mist drip on boughs, nests, the architect spider. I've been hit, sitting here all this time, sun embedded in the same fog where chickadees invited me into the big leaf maple, where frenetic Anna's humming her wings, her beak in the hot lip petals, and a nuthatch at the suet, where a fearless ground squirrel's articulated paw poises to leap, where shadows cross the grass and a maple holds back dawn, from the sea's depth, pale sunlight can't touch. Half of earth covered in lightless water, miles deep, dark since the beginning of the world. Dark below the world of forms, my mother's voice gone, though I still hear inside her last breath, 
her granddaughter in tears collapsed against the fluttering shadow as she rose from the cave of death rattle and asked, What? What? Why are you crying? And we never heard her utter another human sound. At the care center, a half dozen miles from home, of all the women in the hall, the one who spoke so musically in undocumented accent often came to her door with two cups of coffee, or else my mother lay days in wool blankets, newscaster chat the only human sound. Tonight I can't take the news, misery recounted by talented voices, so I play a record as I mince the garlic and drown potatoes. Bill Evans usually eases my sadness for her heart-shaped stone thousands of miles away. Late at night he can pounce back in my ears. A tune we love might turn its needle on the brain. This morning in the kitchen I sang to the dogs. For her, gone beyond us my voice imitating Fats Waller's as I fry the bacon. I'm gonna sit right down and write myself a letter. Food, pant the dogs, food, food. Willa, wounded at the dog park, Junie, my son's affable Newfie, and make believe it came from you. Food, food, food before song. Just now the Navy jets slice the tips of hemlocks. Their war games hush our neighborhood songbirds. A growler from the air base, it flattens the solo Evans recorded at Sanders Theater. Those lyrics mocked our war in Korea. Suicide is painless. The theme from M.A.S.H. My salt fingertips tap to his effortless piano. Once I was a random citoyen on Sandra's stage in Brecht's Last Days of the Paris Commune. Wouldn't cut my hair, so I lost the lead. And the International blazed my ears for decades. In the attic room she gave me, on winter nights I drummed out cantos with a wooden spoon, and on espresso eked out a paradiso translation. Memories idyllic now, but still I can croon her back into my life. Though today random citizens scrape out diseased infernos, mingling in iced ditches, those nights when scrolled names were the dead coming home from Vietnam, the TV with no human sound, wind mewing above snow, she gave me her last wool blanket. Those nights, my radio coiled low, I inhabited a risky peace, it abides even now as I tweeze this parsley swag from a garnish and bounce to John Coltrane, who hammers on an iron wall to the angels of thinnest air and of terror. I call you down from the nine circles of ice, a love supreme, a love supreme, a love supreme. Scrape of a claw on the tiles at 5 a.m. I light the garden lamp. A raccoon in mid-escape stops on the, stop, on the top stone step. Effortlessness. She twists round, tilts her crude squint toward me, not flapping my arms, not clanging pots. I've almost forgotten our warm bed. She straightens to full height, detached, gazes down on me, and waddles into the dark. Mid-morning, coastal fog burns off the coiled sweep of yews, blue spruce twined high up in the body of fog, where sunlit limbs drop gold bracelets onto pierced ferns. 
a fog to cure memory, to take surprise out of the wind, shivers the blond bark of Madrona, shaped like the bruised hip of a woman reluctant to dance, whose sincere breath heaves beneath silk, roots bathed in spring rain. This is the day the giantess, the peleated woodpecker in her throaty darkness, new cool white strip tailwind, stringy long-shot arrow, soared the hemlock edged with sun imploding blue and bloodshot, red-head ancestor unquiet in the dark, my brash heart grown up in smoke. The world's gone into dew. Solicitous waves of mist rarely get inside the house, but just at the edge of the garden they plume from in a stream. What do we know of the settled life? It showers us with the givens, apples, cherries, pears, gooseberry. Things drop on the ground or we pluck their stems, over-ripened, and, but for worms and ants, no competition. In the darkest sea, a rain of particles make perfect a world with what falls, while carnivores prey in currents only slightly less hostile than black interplanetary space. When Rachel Carson recorded autopsy deep dive seals, their spongy stomachs held bones of fish non existent in the known world, a dark deep where daylight never entered. Dark as where Dante, underground in purgatory, pinpoints his origins as one might to a fellow cruise ship passenger. Permezza Toscana si spazia un fumicel che nasce in Volterona. Surely you must know where I'm from. Right down the middle of Tuscany, fumes a tributary born in Volterona. Imagine his booming voice as he sang out in that dank passage of underworld torture. Centomiglia! Hundreds of thousands. Centomiglia waterfalls can't glut it up until the slimed wretch he's boasting to blurts out. You mean the Arno? From headwaters, teeming alpine waves broke up Peloro, when I once cast breath up there, pointing out the distance where Venus has gone now, deep into woods to the west, a diamond split apart by silhouettes of boughs and trunks. Tomorrow she'll set earlier, in a smoke-dusk haze, transcendence we won't see again. If Dante had been female, wouldn't God have been a woman, no hell, purgatory, no forgiveness, no reprisal. In short, Divina Commedia would have gone unwritten. I wondered this as the uniform in charge lined us up on the old neighborhood street and called out, Where is Dante? Dante, step forward. To my left, my close ally began, I am Alighieri. I'm the Dante you want. That profile, I couldn't mistake it, fierce as a raven. But then another, someone at the end of the line, spoke up. No, no, it's me. I am Dante Alighieri. Then another, again and again, until it was my turn. And he stood in front of me, that glow of the powerful who feel nothing. Yes, I stammered. I'm the one. I'm Dante. I'm Dante. That same lineup of slaves, it never changes, like Spartacus. They collect us all anyway, and we move out. Sandals in slush and frozen mud into the built world to redesign the gas chamber. In movies, destruction of the built world is part of the fun. In cities, it's terrorism or development, but in the wild, it's simply business getting out of hand. Wildfire, heat wave, glacial melt, 
ice storm, hurricane, deep freeze, we're told will adapt. After the ordeal of even a small, unworthy medical misfortune comes the renewal. Dahlias restive in their milk bottle, water mirrors, windows magnify us, unbeholden to, unfazed by our mutterings and sprinklings as we shuffle from plant to flower bed to the new spruce leaning over the little leaning over a little too dry, dry earth, dreaming fire, brown needles whimper to the green, noodling us for missing the rain. Oh, western wind, when will we have enough of thee? When shall I come, O oh Christ, into her arms again? Do you remember us? Raw for love, in the blue light, in blue sweat. And then the chickadees swept in, and what kind of a life is that? Masked gang in caped wings, the breezes of September thin the sharp tomato leaf off a wild seed. The bees who do so well avoided fury beneath the shady legs of Delphinia. Quali sapes estate nova per florea ruor exercet sub sole labor. How the swarm toils in summer heat to cultivate the sunny blossoms, the sunny blossoms throughout the countryside. Or, pretty good weed, we used to say, before the government got a hold of it. Not what this is about farther than I have ever gone. Down the hill last night, I blew smoke due west. Through trunks and branches of guardian trees, I didn't recognize the shine, a surprise, an innocence of moon as it set all alone. Once again, on another August 6th, a silence without art, and out of the black sea of my sleep, I am destroyer of worlds. Oppenheimer, the million killer, is said to have said, member of a communist cell, possibly card carrying, did that plume scorch the desert with Stalin's paranoia. And missing sleep again my fingertips along the bumpy wall. I tap my way down the corridor, where, at the top of the stairs and the broad triangular skylight, dangles from the thread of deepest darkness a glistened pairing, the shaved nugget of the moon, a new moon, which has also just arisen. It brings me back to yesterday's evening raven, who yacked a warning above the fried snag, where, unruffled, the osprey had returned to perch for hours. Those black wings above me, those feral beating flaps, the Promethean breeze of them, all but brushing along my cheek, sank into the air so reminiscently, their intent rush above this forest, and echoed his fleeing with that first pillage, the gold of the moon in his caw. My own moonrise on a Monday came one dawn when all the summer months burned while we drove the cattle down a city street, raised dust without jeers from that Easterner, Charles Pierce, whose name he insisted rhymed with purse, and who shattered the notion of identity as nothing, just a habit. Cowboys of the sage, his contemporaries, hooping a rope overhead. That's not who you were, he said. You nothings, you, your monotonous clicks of time, rope, horse, the dust bowl itself, predictable as church bells. Or driving cattle down the wrong thoroughfare. Any new identity brews a new habit. We adjust purse proclaimed, to evolve our perfect ethics. Hegel thought so too. History, 
the absolute self-actualized. Both were white supremacists improvising to capitalize on hidden earth. My mouth holds back nothing but emergency, not to speak too quickly, as if a song might be useful to update our own herd's imprint on the cave. No one goes off and harangues a slow, dull citizen without they've found their own intimidating nose twisted from wrath. Anger and hate for the Republic lost on anyone with a joke store hammer to wield against the diamond cutter's window, soliloquies pouring out left and right, but no one wants to hear. Speak gently, you lion tamers, over the sizzled flesh of contemporaries. The bones cackling at the barbecue remind us of our own despised freedoms. Physical anthropology, the guiding science for white supremacists before 1945, claimed race was biology. When Nat Turner rebelled, 200 people murdered in retribution. In Franz Boas's cultural anthropology, difference arises by custom, mores, morals, mythos, language, by habit. Race was fiction. How much was lost, or almost lost? Raven runs off with the moon. Fellows of the mind, Krober, Professor Boas, to capture a culture all but fled from history, left race behind. Raven steals the light, three crows on the roof in the morning, a shine on black wings for the first time, each leaf stirred by breeze, small and tart, a building just becoming visible, mountain ridge lines etched by first sun, edges of the peak distinct against its light before the gray again, then sheets of steel sky, the morning the great blue heron lifts its first shadow, slow as ice forming over the pond. Boaz, Krober, Mead, Levi Strauss. Unblinking reality, race is a lie. Nothing but an emergency, the emergency of love in a poem by an arch villain. I'm so sick of love, sick roses, foul mouths of jaybirds, their jewelry fattened on a snapped branch. The rainfall blooms, too awful to deny, summer can't be hanging on, and the taste of what comes next is a mad kiss from a monster stirred by winter tempests and soaking torrential forlorn yearnings for old love in the park with shit-eating pigeons. Go away, last swallow, the story of summer's broken record, torn movie tickets, greasy popcorn, clogged sewers. When the storm comes, what could be more bearable than death? Walter, the pinpoints in his eyes, swimming in heroin, wanted me to help him shift his mind to a yogin rescue off the street to a jungle fallen elm, to loose creative twists in leaf strain. I never saw him again. His steamer trunk rotted in my mother's basement. Pictures of gurus, lost scribbles he wanted to secure. Somewhere in the southwest he went to save himself. Can even the habit of addicts lead to a happy death? What could be more bearable than death? Day after day another elegy. Old friends, I planned to see you again. Famously inspiring, I hoped to hear you sing again in living voice, grieved now far away and eulogized in another city, gone from this killing virus, though you're upright in my photos. 
are gone from a dead lung, wilted prostate, cracked heart's infarction, brain aneurysm, or did you simply fall down the stairs? What could be more bearable? Getting used to not seeing that agony, to not know that that's my agony, and wishing it on the enemies squatting at the state house, where two chickadees flew up near the domed ceiling and went wild as I was meditating the treachery of this frail existence when my cell blurted out a bugle call and I charged outdoors, device clutched to ear. Without so much as a nod to metaphysics, the machine itself shaped my compliance. I, operator, flick a switch, turn key, tap the cartoon face of a button, and behaviors required by binary design take place as suitable to the device. And I listen, having greeted with my automaton cheer, and suddenly no real grief. In this diseased specter slouching across the terrain, yet another dear friend died suddenly. There's an agony to be so far away, locked inside these keys. We go unstill as a bird gone wild, high against the domed ceiling, climbing higher just to learn all over again. How do we dial up compassion? Cattails stream from the southern end of the pond. Red wings, if we're lucky, will sway there. Their scarlet shoulders, the tint reflected off the peleated's bright, bold scalp. His chunked out holes in the cedar and fir, what's left of the old ones, checkered up their crisp barks where termites hid, where palest of legs on a half-inch spider scrambled to swing on a thread, trapezist in the old growth who dwells apart, no gloved brother to reach across nothingness, to read out verses for the great leap. Faith, like my sister who takes it as a given, everyone she ever loved has gone to heaven, dogs included. How I miss that burning belief the ardent philosophers quenched in me, to rationalize into a quasi-Buddhist okay to every being, until even that seems, that bow and incense, that altar to no denials, like so much dirt. The built world is an interruption of the real. As I drive on the freeway to Seattle, through the ghost of a forest, where I-5 found a pathway to penetrate the woods of North America, Beside its stream of concrete from Mexico to Canada, alder and fir seedlings squirm back the climax forest, dead and gone, but undeterred as spurts of what comes next through cracks in an underground older than concrete. I'm driving past the self-idolatry of the marketplace, and I'm sick of love, as I've said, the colony of the other the built world of metacognition. We draw it out in years of yearning. The mother-in-law hates any other love, the spouse of her own offering to the world. A busload of recruits passes me, an offering to the world on fire from the mothers who couldn't resist, troops of young Americans to the war zone, driven down this freeway. It's that kind of purgatory we miss, where they can stop you on the street and line you up. Doesn't matter how far-fetched your appliances or where in exotic tropics you've vacationed, we can sing out, we're all in Afghanistan. A nice slogan. The liberal mind elevates it to a meaning, but no million will airlift into Kabul to mourn on those built streets the deaths by our drone of innocent women and children. 
Dante would have gone, not missed out on hell. Flying over cities named after former royalty, our own billionaires who came from hovels pulled themselves up to the elegant thresholds of mega-mansions, barricaded from city dwellers, but who, like those prized colonial towns were, hope to rename a planet or engrave their space station with an obscene logo, the habit of identity. Old growth. In awe we name the stand of cedar, remnant of the climax forest, because it survived the built world's incur incursion before clearings and walls, fences and plantings, this was eternity. Dylan Thomas's green fuse corkscrewed through rock, gravel, concrete, through burn, drought, and urban courtyards. Wilderness doesn't get discouraged. The comeback old growth calm as an ocean builds beyond our limits, encased in a glacial erratic roll to the water's edge, immeasurable as glacial milk flooding the built world. Let's not spend the day accomplishing any more. Sea flow in and out of bay monotonous as weekdays, the notion of eternity, calm, desireless, afloat on this inland sea. Petulant ex-junkies cry the eternal reward, but who deserves the sea? It's no less desireless than timelessness. But we do. We do. We crave it never-endingly. My own course of events took place beneath the clamor of a chestnut tree. But it, as well as the tree, never had a chance. Could be the mean old Irish woman who sits inside every golden opportunity, pre-failed my father long before the requisite bombings and the hell they opened over Tokyo. And then he went off to work. Blessed be the foxglove, blistered with directions, ringing out insouciance in the bells with bees. When Walter and Becky emerged from her room, I knew what happened. A bit of awful sex, possibly, from her fierce eyes darting. But Walter's eyes, pinpoints, told another story. They shot up, he fell off his resolve, and she helped. Walter, I never did anything for him. The only guidance he had was in the desert dragging the naked corpse of his only stricken companion. Walter, alone in the crowded house of junkies, their personalities crushed, lumps of ruined flesh without consciously breathing. Randy lived down there, too, thin as a nail pouch, crude to that little girl he kept around, sweet, blonde Melissa, who asked me twice how to get away. He worked at Peter Bent Brigham, in the wing where they kept some pleasant generics he carted home under his shirt. One evening he brought a tank of laughing gas. Twelve white sets of crossed privileged legs on the filthy carpet, passing the breathing mask mouth to mouth. Walter not in the circle, but his trunk in my safe keeping. Finding a highway to search for a desert, as we gagged and inhaled, laughed at danger, the war inside the television, twelve faces frozen, laughter frosted, iced lips curled upward in the stilled laugh of the middle class at the junkies on the sofa under the TV news, where, on December 1st, 1969, I watched the National Lottery at Selective Service Headquarters, and no one moved, unaffected by the numbers corresponding to birth dates. Mine, too high to serve. I'm certain, through that math, another me stood where I might have and took a sniper's hit to his brain. 
or walks today without these limbs I still depend on. Another Walter, wiped out of history by fascism, unveiled the aesthetic deep within underground Paris, a mind of such precision attending to the needs of dark antiquity. Kafka, he said, Walter Benjamin said, was at least a practitioner of what Malebranche calls the natural prayer of the mind, attentiveness. Like the saints in their prayers, he included all created beings. Even today, a woman is crying on the evening news who regrets the loss due to drying up the lakes and hills of Michigan for her grandchildren who will never learn to ski real snow. And a dying poet feels terror more from the weather's new severity, relentlessly raw and blistering. A Chinese math teacher who was at Sandy Hook reckons the likelihood of her being shot in a public school. It's immoral, she says, to single myself out. I only count for one. She reminds me of Simone Weil, who won't be free unless we all are. Until, a bodhisattva might have said, yet the sainted philosopher held her own salvation ransom unless. Such deaths, the teacher witnessed, expressed as statistical values, as pain. In one lifetime there was some snow. For years Anna's hummingbird never cracked the iced feeder, but now she nests with us through intemperate Januaries. New records every year, volatile heat belts, blizzard freaks sweep the terrain. Incomprehensible disasters report in. We sigh. Poor people, poor people, children left out in the snow. Science has to calculate how to shrink the unpredictable and direct us back to being. We attend by gesture, by conversation, to mutual survival of the probable ahead of the inevitable. Pains cause causality. Divining the causal, the root of compassion. Though the cause never causes, as paradoxical as cool lightning, which is the aftertaste of grace across the lip, of whiskey, of a cruel fleshy scar in the war in the ward where mercy wept, of the sky where thoughts not enough and zigzags a shadow, the hair of a lickety split cat crisscrosses the airport, where drunk uncle plays pickup sticks and the giant beats his wife, where a silver dollar is tossed on the road and thunder don't know your name, lightning, the painful revelation in a glimpse of the map to the city of God. It's the way alder and fir seedlings muscle up through gravel and soil under suburban hedges unnoticed. This is how good you are. By habit bent toward moist sunlight, eternally reestablishing the climax forest, overleaping the built world's timeline. This is how good you are within the human voice imperfect in its misery, to shoulder up through every strangulation by the hideous mindlessness of might, only to be cancelled and then sing forward again and be cancelled again and sing against that perishing cult of purity. This is how good you are, the song dancing in your head, your eyes swing above the sea cloud in the sky. This is how good you are beside the freezing highway, your back to us, thumb out, pretending you don't care about a ride into the west, into the desert. This is how good you are deluding yourself. You'll ever leave a city where cloud formations in magenta bow before azure. This is how good you are reflected in the miracles, 
reflected in the miracle of windows where a cat squints at you because this is how good you are. This is how good you are as the peleated sings over the woods. This is how good you are. The ice wind whirling howls at your numb face hurled from who knows where across the planet. This is how good you are at the crowded urinals down in the tunnels of glassed-in buildings among the unmasked who are shopping underground. This is how good you are, the asteroids swinging past, the seas ascending gracelessly upward, the old growth and flaming arrows, the shivering civil order of how good you are. A good that's only a human's, a good neglected and haunted by the dangers grim and the stricken eyes waiting at the crosswalk. This is how good you are in the waving branches of unleafed maple, the column of ants floundering in sand cracks along the sidewalks of Europe. This is how good the tears are to carve a trail down the historic face who wanders your dream, rise and come up as shadows for the new calendar. This is how good you are, the wrecked faces of diseased street whores, the dollars you withheld from them, dollars flooding the underground mall where the free people live. This is how good you are, those rare mornings when he does arrive, the woodpecker who comes soaring out of hemlock boughs, and his call insists on recognition. This is how good you are, because he's announcing for you his swoop onto the rough bark, already chipped at and beat up by him and the female, who, smaller and less conspicuous without that red cheek streak, the joker's leer, is equally brilliantly crowned. This is how good you are when his jungle cry calls every eye to the porch and he descends the wide maple, not yet gouged like cedar snags on the trail where he's dug, blistered, and knocked off tough sheets of musical notation, when his termite sonata alerts the living forest that he shall have this dance. At last, down the long vortex of maple bark, as he side-eyes the front door, scouts competitors, though he's put the northern flicker on notice, and leaps across the porch, clings by one dark talon, swings on suet cages filled with peanut, his favorite, and this really is how good you are when he plunges his beak, that crimson cap dazzles, curls his torso, tail feathers like ravenous hawks around their prey where he gorges long into the morning till the next shift. A fat squirrel twitches, and the peleated swirls ringingly away.